Swagdeen has taken it upon himself to finally tackle the long-theorized, much-needed draft kit for ARH Destiny. That's right, Dicey Companions is coming soon to support ARH sets. But in doing so, Dean had to deal with a lot of challenges. So today he's going to explain those challenges and his approach to overcoming them. A huge shout out to our channel members for supporting what we do here. If you want to get involved with the channel and the Dice Commando community, please consider joining as a channel member. Remember, these videos are only possible with your support. You can show that support with a like, a subscribe, and by leaving us a comment and sharing your feedback. Community first, and go Commando! Hey there, my Star Wars Destiny friends. Welcome back to the Commando cast, and happy Destiny Friday for another installment of the continued update and announcement of Dicey Companions here with Dean. How's it going, my friend? He is going excellent. Awesome. Well, kind of, not kind of, this is the second installment of this kind of announcement blitz series we have here, talking specifically the challenges around the Dicey Companions kit that you have developed with the intent of supporting ARH draft sets. Now, I will link probably up here somewhere the previous <laughs> video in case you missed it. You can click on that and kind of get the background so we won't spend too much time on that but instead dean i want to hear mm -hmm. from you what were the specific challenges you had to take on when developing a draft kit specifically for the arh stuff and then kind of lead us through how you approach solving those sure so with a, a draft kit in general there are a handful of like restrictions that just kind of come in inherently so like you have to design a handful of characters but you don't want them to be a team off the bat so, you know, you, you have to take characters that you draft. So that's kind of a weird restriction as far as, like, your points uh, to characters. Um, and you have to be able to build a 30-card deck, ideally, because mill is a win condition. So you want to make it so that your your card pool can support building up to 30 cards so you don't have uh, an inherent, um, you know, downside there. And then with the ARH era stuff especially the first couple sets there was a ton of cards that were limited in their design so they were um i guess for history's sake there was a lot of like rainbow decks mm -hmm. at the end of ffg so arh wanted to support the idea of like leaning hard into a subtype building an all inquisitor team building an all spy team so that they could have equal power to a rainbow team that have access to everything. Mm -hmm. um, so they really uh, supported those very focused constructed decks. But the downside of these focused constructed decks is that a lot of those cards are just like dead mm -hmm. in a draft format where if you can't spot three inquisitors, this card doesn't play and you're never going to draft three inquisitors. That's just not going to happen. So, um, how do you how do you make draft work when you have those kind of uh, limitations? Like so, they all have logical reasons for them, but it's still like it, it came up with a challenge. So, as I went through all of my testing, I was tracking how frequently was I able to build a thirty card deck, and if I was short, you know how how far from the the mark was it, and what did I need to do to to get that pool? Um, so for the first couple of sets, I actually had to pull. 16 cards from the sets that were just like not playable in draft so an example would be a lot of them are plots so like the extremist campaign plot um the inquisitorious plot things like that don't function there are characters that really only do something if you have them elite so like the han solo that rolls in stormtrooper dice he only really functions elite um so i took him out because he was just typically a dead card. And in, when you can only have so many cards to pull from, I wanted to cut down on how many cards were like just like dead on arrival for you to pull from. But that, that, that Han, he doesn't play. have assigned dice though, right? No. So you but could like, just pull so, one copy and run him elite. It would, but then I thought there's an advantage that if you draw him, you get an elite character. Whereas if you draw anyone else, they don't uh, get an elite that, character. I mean, that, that tracks. Plus, if you're drafting in theory, you don't necessarily have those rolling dice either. But yeah. Yeah. So we did have to cheat. That actually does get into something, which is that a lot of cards in the ARH era mm -hmm. pull cards with them. And historically, if you drafted 
you know, the chief Ewok who's supposed to get and add to the team set aside Ewoks, but you didn't draft those Ewoks. If you drafted Krennic and you didn't draft Death Troopers, then you couldn't get them. In my testing, I was allowing the characters to get their stuff because um, I felt like they were built with that power in mind, and I didn't find them to be performing strange that strangely with them. So, because like if you think about that, like Akbar, you can't possibly draft mm. X wings because they're not in that set. Um, so there's lots of characters sure. where they have like it either exists or not. So you could choose to pull that one if you think Akbar is unfair, or if you wanted to honor the old ways. But I was allowing characters to do those things. So Kylo gets his feel your angers and angers, um, et cetera, et cetera. In my in my testing. Um, so yeah, 16 cards I pulled from the FA cycle, mostly plots, but there's a handful of other ones that I didn't find that they functioned. I pulled one from the UH cycle, which was Hunt and Eliminate, and mm. then I didn't pull anything from the Resurgence set. So like, it does get better over time where they have less of that like hard arch subtype stuff that just like don't function in draft, but it was definitely a problem. And then... If you get an expensive character so that and that you like them and you want to build around them, so you have to take two colors. You get, you know, two colors and maybe you use the unspoiled um, you know, six cost uh gray character that's that's coming. Um, so you only have two color pools to choose from. More frequently that set was was not getting up to thirty cards. So mm -hmm. I had to come up with a solution for that, which we'll get into our spoiler, and this um, I was inspired by the card Cracked Bauble from Flesh and Blood, which is a card where if you're drafting and you don't get up to the draft set for the, the deck count, you can add as many of those as you want to the deck, and they just pitch for resources. That's their only function, but you have something there, or other things that might discard a card. I guess you could reference them. So I designed a card, which is the... The 21st cards, this is why the set is going to have one more card than uh, Rivals and Allies of Necessity had, and that is uh, Noble Effort. And it's just a gray card, and you can add as many of these to your deck as you need to to get up to 30. So if you could only put 26 cards together that functioned for your maybe two-color team, you can add four copies of Noble Effort, and... I wanted it to be a card that is conditionally slightly better than just a discard to reroll. So in this case, mm -hmm. if you play it, it lets you reroll a single die twice of yours, or you can just discard and reroll all your cards. So it helps you get up to 30. So like I said, we don't have even more disadvantage to the mill condition, but it has slightly more value than just like a unusable discard to reroll only card. Mm -hmm. Oh, this this a, this makes sense. Way to get to it. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that was the way I was able to solve. I mean, I've I've I was most of the time I was able to get thirty card decks. Once I did uh, pulling all the cards that were kind of dead. Um, the way I constructed it, and the way I'd recommend people to construct it, is that for whatever. Either I was drafting a lot from whole blocks. I also did testing of just individual sets. I would take two of every card, except for plots, battlefields, and unique, like, single value characters. So, like, uh, Uncle Owen or, like, Marva characters that don't have an elite possibility, but they're unique, so you can't have, like, two of them. Um, I would only have one of those in the pool, two of everything else. I separated dice from non-dice. You know, I'd take eight dice cards. I would take 32 non-dice cards, and that was my pool to build from. Mm -hmm. And by taking out those dead cards and not getting, you know, like two of the same battlefield, two of the same plot, things like that, I was able to consistently, most of the time, build um, 27 to 30 card decks. Most of the time, I got 30. And then on the times when I didn't, most of the time, if I didn't, I had two colors and I might take two to three copies of Noble Effort, and then I felt good about mm -hmm. the deck. 
And, uh, you know, obviously when we were drafting, you know, in the olden days when you were drafting from packs, there was, there was a rarity issue there, right? Which yes. drove, I mean, your dice cards. I mean, that's, that's what the rarity was. I mean, we yeah. had different rarities, but not really. Well, I mean, we kind of did with the uncommons were basically the same as a, for functionally a dice card, but you would get one mm -hmm. dice card per pack. So did your, your system, did it budget for that? Um, so yeah, cause I, but I separated the pools, the dice cards and the non dice cards. Um, and he got eight dice cards. So that was replicating the, uh, the rarity, uh, set from the FFG era. I found that I actually did the math on it. I averaged drawing 3.65 characters, uh, when you drew eight from the AH era. Cause like I said, the math is different. They have less filler cards. So I don't know how that would compare to FFG exactly, but. I felt like you got characters a little bit more in this um, draft experiment. So um, you get less, but then it's, it's better than the alternative, whereas there are times with FFG ones where you get like one character and it was you know much harder to build your team. You tend to have more options here, but you might have less support dice for them with the ARH era. Um, but like the 3.65, so you're averaging, you're usually getting three characters to choose from and five dice cards, mm -hmm. um, in my experience uh, in testing, to uh, to build with, which I think was uh, was pretty fair. And then with this set, I will say that um, plots have been more of a thing. Uh, the plots, I think, are just generally more useful than the ones that were available in Allies of Necessity. And it was like roughly half the time I utilized plot uh, in my testing. So they're a little bit more prevalent in this format, I found, at least in, in my design and testing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a good lead in, right? Because one of the challenges we talked about a bit in the last episode as well was the, the heavy subtype theme, uh, and you mm -hmm. referred to it a bit earlier here as well, right? The heavy subtype theme of like the early FA block or the FA block itself. So... Can you, I'll go ahead and throw up Ride or Die, and you can explain to us how you developed this to kind of help skirt that problem, kind of cheat that problem a little bit. Sure. So there are a lot of cards um, of spotting subtypes, and especially in volume. You know, there's a card where, you know, if you spot three of the subtype, it's an amazing card. If you spot two of that subtype, it has value. If you spot one of it, like, it's not great. It's a suboptimal card. And I wanted to make it more consistent that you would get at least like the okay value off of those cards. So the uh, ride or die plot, which is just a one cost, which fits in very easily. And when you play a card, it basically allows you to grant a subtype on one of your characters to a second character. So if you have a card that, you know, it gets better, the more troopers you can spot or whatever, this card gets you to that like second value which makes them more playable um and the, the, i found a lot of cards just in the whole arh era had that kind of mechanic where there were benefits to being able to spot more than one of a particular subtype and having a way to turn that on at least for individual card plays um you know really unlocked those cards for us okay so ride or die itself is really just unlocking or fr freeing you up, I guess, to explore multiple subtypes mm -hmm. if you, because you probably have to, to your point, to make 30, you're probably going to have to draft cards that you can utilize couple, different. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to be able to go just witch or just night sisters or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And it was different than just giving someone a subtype, um, it was giving a second person of that subtype. Like there's there's a decent pool of cards where that value happens. You know, if you spot a pilot, you get this. You spot two pilots, you get this. Or if you you know, there's a lot of those kind of cards, and I wanted those to be playable in the format because a lot of design space was spent there mm -hmm. for ARH things that I, I wanted to support their innovation, and that was one of their things. They were they you know they did lean into subtypes. Even in the new sets, while they don't have as many spot requirements, they still have rewards for multiples of are leading into subtypes. So I think it was very restrictive in the FA cycle. It was a lot of spot and inquisitor, 
spot two inquisitors you can only do this if all of your people are inquisitors like those kinds of cards um they've made less spot requirements but like i said the value a lot of times comes in the in the multiplicity on some of these subtypes okay so you you also mentioned you've been using a lot of plots in i use them more often than i thought like but okay, if you fair. think back to drafting allies of necessity it would be it would most of the time i didn't want to use those plots i didn't want to use was it grand design or i forgot the names of most of them <laughs> so, well, um, so some of them it, poked their way into because leia yoda mill was using bill was using the one yeah. and you know there's always fun janky allies of necessity uh decks that use that plot you know to get the negative two um but in general like they were because they were still adding they were still kind of creating the plot subtype or the plot card type at that time they weren't super powerful or, or innovative at the time like they were they were pretty basic functions so i felt like i could i could do a little bit more with these here and they're they're generally more helpful so i, I find you're taking them off more often okay so I'll go ahead then, and with your authorization, we'll throw up the red and the blue plots that we have here, sure. and you can you can walk us through this. So let's do let's do the witches. I mean, I've got them both up now, but let's do talk about the witches. Gift of shadows. Yeah. So gift of shadows. I wanted to if you draw blue characters, and especially you know this is somewhat of a spoiler if you watch if you haven't watched the Ahsoka show, but you know they basically created a witch. Uh, in the show, so I was like, okay, now, now that's not just like, you know, a function in the game. It's actually kind of a, a flavor thing that that happens in the universe that you can make people witches. So, having a plot that grants witch to your blue characters. So if you drafted Inquisitors or you drafted Jedi's or whatever, um, but you got a bunch of witch cards or got witch cards worth playing, this turns that functionality on for you and then also gives you kind of like the witch archetype um stuff if you had had them so they, they usually were manipulating with like odd uh numbers mm -hmm. you know so it kind of turns that on so even if you didn't draft any witches but you got witch cards and you wanted to play in that witch space it kind of you know got you there just with the plot and it was you know thematic mm-hmm And then how about Call to the Council, also from uh, the same series, at least the art? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is another one. I felt like it was you know, reasonably thematic where people get drafted into war. So, you know, Call the Council and you make your red characters troopers. So if you drafted pilots, leaders, things like that, you could turn the trooper on to, to make your trooper archetype kind of cards a little bit better. Uh, and then I also, I was playing with the idea, um, one of the unspoiled plots, I guess, also has this element where we can deal damage to a plot. So in this case, it basically functions as a bubble shield where it can take indirect damage, but it can't take regular direct damage. It's just indirect. So it's like it's, it's not uh, an automatic three bump to your health, but specifically indirect damage it will take three before it pops um to get more value out of the the two costs you're going to sink into getting it but i've found it's been useful when i wanted to get more trooper stuff going on also getting that that three conditional uh help on health uh made this a plot worth taking mm -hmm. yeah fair enough fair enough all right, well, we look forward to seeing the rest of this over the next couple of weeks or perhaps on on drop cuz uh can you keep us up to speed on the the timeline obviously is a little fluid because we want it to release before the ARH set and as of the time of us shooting this, we don't know exactly when the ARH set is releasing. Yep. But we so our goal is to be roughly a month ahead of when they drop. We wanted people to have a chance to um you know, we said it in the announcement, but like all of the uh, dice for these sets are parallel dice. They're the ones that already exist. If you have an FFG collection, we want people to be able to acquire them, get them together, print these cards. And then also, as soon as we drop this, you can draft any existing ARH set right away and have fun with it there. But 
to have this so that you can have it on hand to draft the new set when it drops and we can be a part of that hype machine getting us all ready for um, the experience that we used to have. A new set drops, you draft with it, and then you eventually get into building your you know, perfectly constructed uh, decks. But you know, be able to have that janky, crazy time where we learn all the new cards together uh, at a draft event is is the experience that I felt like we'd been missing and mm-hmm. i'm excited that we might be able to get that finally happening yeah awesome well in in the meantime uh folks can expect at least at least one more episode talking about this specifically you're going to walk people through essentially how you went through doing the draft correct yeah i'll probably get into some of the specific challenges and and some of my choices and probably maybe show off another card or something um prior to to full release and uh yeah, so you guys get into my headspace and hopefully uh, fall in love with the draft kit as I have. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks, Dean, for sitting down with us yet again. Another week here, and uh, we expect to see you probably real soon because by the time we get these up and roll through, we're going to be running out of time towards release. So by the time you are watching this at home, probably only yeah. two, three weeks away from release. So, But again, we want to make sure that it's enough time before but close enough to the release that they can kind of piggyback on each other. So, Yep. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to highlight and support what they're doing. So we don't yep. want to steal any thunder, but we also we just want to get in there ahead of time and then be part of that ramp up. Awesome. Well, anything else you want to add, Dean? Uh, no, I think, I think that's it for, uh, for now. You know, spoiler wise, I want to give everything away. Yeah. There's uh, 20, 21 cards at this point. You'll have seen five, I think. Six, I think. Good. Yeah. Yeah, six. There you go. Yeah. So you're already you're already spoiled. <laughs> Spo- they're all spoiled out for the for the moment. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. Well, just want to remind everybody, right? Your comments are always appreciated. Dean does a great job of getting down and answering those questions and interacting with you on these videos. So don't hesitate to. Leave him a comment, even if you just want to tell him how amazingly awesome he is. So thank you, Dean, for joining us. Thank you all for joining us as well. And if nothing else, Dean, say it with me. Go Commando. Go Commando.